Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat. Transcribed with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When September fades and autumn has caught hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. The tumbling leaves of red and gold are pasted in flight against shop window. The stuffed squirrels nibble at the plastic acorns, and the mannequins smile the smile of the season, emotion compounded of wax and the new mink coat. Minor miracles may also be observed. Pink in the cheek, spring in the step, and freshness in the air. It's a new time on Broadway, a time of beginning again. So open a charge account. The world is yours. And downtown, where I was, police headquarters, the day is different according to quality of violence. For instance, this day... To death. Fractured cricoid and hyoid cartilage, etc., etc. You know, standard bruises and fractures for strangulation. What about the strangler, Muggerman? Uh, name's Al, uh, let me see, Al Whittier, emergency hospital. Officer Kenny Slug caught him in the chest just above the heart. Maybe Whittier will live, maybe he won't. You want to talk to that lady now? Yeah, get her. Mrs. Bell? In here, Mrs. Bell. When are you going to let... take it easy, Mr. Hendricks. We'll get to you as soon as we can. Right in here, Mrs. Bell. It's Lieutenant Clover. Hello. Hello, Mrs. Bell. Uh, no, mind. I'd like to say my say and get out. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Well, she was screaming. Mrs. Temple was, right? Mrs. Temple was screaming. And I heard... You live right across from the Temple apartment, right? You leave me alone and let me tell my story and let me get out of uh, here. Go on, Mrs. Bell. You know where I live. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Sure. Go on. Well, so she was screaming. And I heard, like, furniture falling all over the place. I quick ran across the hall and knocked on the door and said, Are you all right, Mrs. Temple? Are you all right, Mrs. Temple? I stood there knocking and the screaming stopped. Detective Mark? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, sure. What about him? I'll take that phone over there, Marlon. Mr. Temple, Danny's calling from Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, hello, Mr. Temple. Well, sure, okay, I can uh, Mrs. Bell. The screaming stopped. Look, I never knew what the word onim, um, 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 uh, uh, ominous. Yeah, ominous. I never knew what it really meant, but it popped into my mind. The silence behind that door after her screaming stopped. Then what did you do? Well, then I ran down the end of the hall to the fire escape window and yelled for the cops. That one, uh, that one, that. His name's uh, Officer Kenny. Well, uh, he was using the call box. He come a running, kicked in the door. What did you see when the door? Uh... You know. What do you ask me questions you know for? Your people took pictures of it. Her, Mrs. Well, Temple, goodbye. lying there strangled to death, and that fellow, yes. you took pictures of it. Goodbye. And you know what a picture is. Temple from Chicago, Danny, reaction about his wife's being murdered, he repeats over and over, it's too bad. His plane's being grounded in the kind of weather, but he'll be in New York as soon as he can. Right. A thousand words. Huh? Well, I was just telling Lieutenant Clover what a picture was. Well, thanks, Mrs. Bell. You can go home now. Oh, pardon me, ma'am. I guess when you open the door to come out, I It's was... quite all right. I'm sure. Hi, fellas. Hi, Gino. Gino. Here, take a look at this, huh? They speak of coincidence as being a long arm, don't they? Well, there's proof of the pudding. What are you talking about, Gino? Right here, Danny. Look, this classified ad. Officer Guth, our college boy policeman, spotted it. He spends his time looking for bargains and classified, and so Two he saw... Two complete rooms of furniture, bedroom and parlor, 14-piece, and two 10-by-12 rugs. $75 takes it away. 12, 12, 12, 12 East 38, East. apartment 3D, where Mrs. Temple was strangled and Al Whittier was shot. When I said long arm, I'm not... Nice far... going, Gino. I'll thank God. On your way out, send Mr. Hendricks in, huh? Sure thing you know. That way in to see Danny Clover... Okay, Mr. Hendricks, let's have it. I figured the best thing to do in a case like this is prepare a statement. I did it while I was waiting. Fine, fine. We're glad you did. Seemed logical. We're glad you did, Mr. Hendricks. Thank you. I have been the employer of Carl Temple, husband of the deceased, for six years. He's employed by my company, Dimpney Hosiery. Huh? Ask your wife. 
If she's heard of hosiery, she's heard of Dimpney hosiery. Dimpney hosiery as a salesman. When called for information by the police department as to his whereabouts, I solemnly swear that to the best of my knowledge, he is in Chicago... You told us all about that, Mr. Hendricks. We'd like to hear about how the two of them got along. Great. Just like that, huh? What else you want to know? They were selling their furniture, would you... Sure. Uh... I can tell you all about it. Carl earned a doggone decent bonus. His wife had been wanting new furniture, so they were selling theirs, I guess. Danny? But... Yeah, you know. Detective Dennison just called in. He talked to Al Woody, his landlady, Danny. Told her what happened, that he'd strangled a woman. Dennison reported the following. Landlady shrugged, said people do what they got to do, she guessed. Anyhow, Al Woody had left the house this morning looking for furniture. Landlady told him, pick out a couple of rooms of furniture for himself, hold it under $75. Woody has been beefing, he needed new furniture. So ends my report from Detective Dennison. I'll make an observation. You'll do what? Whittier saw the ad in the paper, went to look at the furniture at the Temple apartment. There was some sort of an argument, and Whittier strangled Mrs. Temple. Uh, thank you very much. About does it, huh, Danny? So the business of violence, the commonplaces of violence, having to do with used furniture and a salesman's bonus, with a policeman's bullet, and grief grounded in Chicago but flying in in a few hours... Husband's grief for strangled wife, delayed because September wins a loft race on other flight schedules. Common places of autumn violence. Interrogations, statements, releases, identities. To be checked, filed, confirmed. Against drift of the time of autumn. And for a little while more, the stillness of the office. And leave it then. And at end of corridor... Rectangle of sunlight opening onto the violent streets. Legwork then. At offices of Dimpney Hosiery, be told by an employee of 20 faithful years who shows you the gold watch in which they have been buried and epitaphed, be told that Carl Temple was a traveler, yes. Not often at home, yes. But always the leather framed photograph of his wife Harriet on top in his suitcase, on top of the hosiery samples. The first thing he saw in distant hotel rooms. The last thing he put away. And the long-distance messages via the office phone to be relayed to Carl's wife if they'd been kept would have made a sheaf of poetry. Carl, model husband. Harriet, model and faithful wife. And five years of love between them. A pleasure to watch. The marriage of a hosiery man. And in another place, in the neighborhood of Carl and Harriet Temple, be told, Carl's homecomings were festive. There was beer and the freshest of delicatessen. And their marriage was without thorns. And from another neighbor, Mrs. Myron... Yes, I knew them, both of them, from before they were married. So? The things we have to fill in, Mrs. Myron, the kind of woman Mrs. Temple... Dead. Dead woman, choked to death by a man. That's all you need to know, isn't it? Well, I meant to... It's important to you what Harriet was before she met Carl... When she could have had her pick of a dozen men, decent men, fine men, men who would have... Mr. Temple isn't that kind of man, is that what you're trying to tell me? Mr. Temple isn't that kind of man. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Well, everyone I've talked to in his office, in the neighborhood... Hmm, what do they know? They peek from behind window shades and they know something. They sell silk stockings to women and they know something. But you do, huh, Mrs. Byron? But Carl Temple, the things I know... Tell me... What I know is from before he was married. You understand that? What he got to be after he married Harriet, what kind of love he had for her, what he did for her, I don't know. I don't care. When she married Carl, I wrote her off my book, him and her. But what Carl was before... You're going to tell me, huh? I met him once, before he knew Harriet. It was at a party. One of those parties where no one knows anyone else. Where what's been, what's going to be, is buried in the bottom of a gin bottle. Buried three nights in a row. One of those parties, you know. Party where you were? And where Carl Temple was. Where Carl Temple whispered in my ears the kind of man he was. And, uh, and I was lucky. Wasn't every girl he briefed like that. Go on. A couple of weeks later, I ran into Harriet. She said she'd met Carl Temple. She said she loved him. She said she was going to marry him. I said, you do, and I'll write you off my book, Harriet. She did anyhow. And anyhow. What? Anyhow, 
I've no remorse. I warned her. I told her. I laid it out to her. Now look what she's got. Because she wouldn't listen. Danny? Got something, Muggerman? Yeah. On Carl Temple, the eastbound widower. So what about him? Fellow with a record. Not much of a record, not too unusual in his type of profession, but... You said Carl Temple had a record? A police blotter, February 3rd, 1947. Drunk and disorderly. Mm -hmm. Picked up from a meeting promoting nylons for the entire female population of the eastern and midwestern states. Agenda, documentary-type promotion films. Then drinks and entertainment after. It's when we picked the boys up stoned with booze. Carl Temple had to be carried. What you said before, Muggerman, not too unusual. Except for this. One of the entertainers fell or was pushed from the 12th-story hotel room where the meeting was in progress. She died in an alley. The agent who booked the acts didn't know her name. Nobody did. That's why in Potter's Field, the marker on her grave says Jane Doe. Everyone was questioned, but... You mind I get that, Danny? My pleasure. Lieutenant Clover's office, Detective Muggerman. Yeah. Yeah, you put him through. Long distance from Chicago, Danny. Carl Temple called. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Temple... Well, that's nice. Then we can expect you in a few hours. Yeah. No, Mr. Temple, we have... Danny! I just got word oh, from... Hold it, will you, Gino? A man's trying to talk to me all the way from Chicago. Detective Muggerman, I am supposed to know this information just from the expression... Uh, just hold it, huh, Gino? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Temple. Well, don't worry about that. We'll meet you at the plane. That's right. It'll save time. No, no, no trouble, Mr. Temple. You're welcome, Mr. Temple. Temple, Danny, he apologized again for keeping us waiting. He says the weather's lifted and he's boarding a plane. Says he's on his way. What were you trying to say, you know? That I just got word from the hospital. Dr. Sinsky said if you were busy just to relay to you the information concerning... Get off it, huh, Gino? What information? That Al Whitty, a strangler of Harriet Temple, died in his sleep a few minutes ago. Peacefully. That information, Detective Mugovan. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Look around the house. Everything snug and secure? Look more carefully. If there are frayed wires in your house, on lamps, or on any electrical fixture, things are less secure than they seem. If there's rubbish any, anywhere accumulating in your house, things aren't secure at all. The time you take to prevent a fire before it can happen is worth your life and property. This week, Fire Prevention Week... Clean up for fire safety. With autumn, the daytime is of a new texture on Broadway. Faces of women paler, their walk no more languid nor slow. Swirlings of morning mist from colder waters and the sheen of pavement chill, which is why hawkers are sheltered now in doorways and empty arcades which is why the autumn deals are slipped out of topcoat pockets, frayed, and the smell of mothballs on them. And the, off, the hawker's autumn tune, Get With It, Kid, or Get Lost. And because warm of summer has long since been sold out, because new season was on you before you knew it, set the hawker's deal and know the terms. The clause where it says, Not responsible for loss. That stands. <laughs> And other autumn textures at police headquarters, morning coffee. Cold in waxed container and a cigarette ground into it. Texture of morning newspapers folded to yesterday's violence, creased. You read this one, Danny? No. Feature stuff. They let an artist loose on this one. Artist with an imagination. Oh? Al Whittier, unknown killer. Why he strangled Harriet Temple. Hey, look, Danny, nine reasons illustrated. Mungerman, uh... Oh, just a minute, huh, Danny? Home, my wife lets me read my breakfast paper. Hey, how about this? They dug up a photo from six years ago where Jane Doe hit the alley 12 floors down from a hotel room and... and this. Artist conception of room she dropped out of. Chaps and paper hats, smoke of fat cigars. Hey, this one's labeled Carl Temple. <laughs> Life-size cake on the table, champagne buckets. <laughs> you finished, Mungerman? Uh, mm hmm. Yep. Breakfast's over, huh, Danny? Now we Yeah, now. 
What about Colonel Temple? I left the report down at the front desk, didn't I? No. Oh, it doesn't matter a whole lot. I just left your note saying I picked up Mr. Temple at the airport real early this morning. Mm -hmm. First thing he wanted to do was see his wife. I said, sure. Took him to the funeral parlor where... What? Well, he looked at her. He yelled once from here. And he fell in a heap. I checked his doctor a while ago. The doc says Mr. Temple's doing fine. He'll let me know the minute when Mr. Temple can be questioned. Then you'll let me know, huh, Muggerman? You'll let... Danny, there is a gentleman outside who wishes to converse with you. Who is it, Gino? A Philip Stanley. He says, if you are troubled about a Jane Doe who fell from 12 floors years ago, he can serve. Well, that's how he said it, Danny. His very... Go him in, Gino. This way to Danny Calder, Mr. Stanley. Thank you, Sergeant. My presence puzzles you, gentlemen. I can see that on your faces. Yeah, it sure does, Mr. Stanley. Six and a half years is a long time to wait for a man who says he can serve us. Yes, isn't it? Sit down, Mr. Stanley. Uh, no, thank you. I can observe your reactions better if I stand. So... Uh, here I can study your faces when... When you tell us what you know about a Jane Doe. Whose memory this morning was rekindled for me by the newspapers. Who fellow was pushed out of a 12-story window six and a half years ago. And I was there. Your faces reflect the exact emotion I had hoped for. Uh, from men of your profession, that is. We're glad for you, Mr. Stanley, both of us. Well, thank you. You said you were there. Yes, and there it was also that I studied human emotion and reflex and reaction to my probings. I do that, you know. We didn't know. You do what, Mr. Stanley? A study, observed, question, humanity, its uh, specimens, their strengths, their frailties, their hidden things. You get paid for doing that? Oh, it has its own compensations. Uh, for my other needs, I'm employed as a companion uh, to an elderly gentleman who's... We'll named... get that later. Right now... Oh, we'll... right now, of course, Jane Doe who was perhaps of the uh, more interesting of the feminine specimens whose wings I have pinned back, caught, as it were, under my glass slide. And this one you caught at a company party six and a half years ago. Where for an hour I talked with her, where she wept upon me of the frailties of her male who had brought her there and who became immediately enchanted with the talents of the other entertainers, which had forced our Jane Doe to shower attention upon males she had never seen before. That hour... And uh, then she went from me. Then she plunged into space. And I watched her flight. Mr. Stanley. Yes? A student like you, a pure scientist like you, you get your specimen's name? Oh, of course. Uh, Janet Benton. And her Habitat East River apartment. I've tried to recall the uh, um, uh, exact address, but uh, 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 that memory has failed me. I'm sorry. Another question, Mr. Stanley. This happened six and a half years ago. Why did it take uh, you so, so long? So long to come forward with knowledge. Because I should not have been in that place. Because if the uh, elderly gentleman to whom I am companion would ever have known, why, uh, when he dies, he would cut me off without a sou. A gentleman? Uh-huh. Get out of here. And watch Mr. Stanley as he walks over to the door. Starts to turn toward you again. Thinks better of it. Makes a decision. Goes through with it. Routine again. Pose the new name. Janet Benton. Girl of six and a half years ago. Girl who once lived someplace near the river. Mr. Stanley didn't know exactly where. So search an old city directory and come up with an address that matched. Janet Benton, it read, then some dots, then 537 First Avenue. A one-line statistic, life according to page and column that didn't appear the next year. Go there. Ride September's streets past noontime people, the folk of the sandwich and cream soda and the yogurt and the bargain basement and the dream. Past them toward river and tugboat and oily green. And close to it, address you're looking for. Hey, you. <coughs> hey, you. Nobody home in there. Thanks. You looking for somebody? I said, Police. are you... Police, what's your name? Well, just because I ask you a question... Well, I'm trying to get some information. I'm looking I've for... I've been known to help people who are courteous. 
and seem honestly in need of help. Well, that's a fine way to feel about it. The fact that your policeman has nothing Fellowship, to do with it. Fellowship, is that what you're trying to say? Absolutely. Well, I really need some information about a woman who used to live in that house next door to you. Uh... Well, I've lived here 20 years, mister. You're right, all right. Women have lived there. Uh, what have you got in mind? Did you know a woman named Benton? That was her last name. Her first name was... Janet. Janet. Well, <sighs> she's gone from here, mister. Lived here, got married, got smart, got who knows what. But gone, that's for sure. Gone. She don't live there. Tell me about her. Well, how am I supposed to know? I'm one of those she just waved to. Oh, you say she got married. Do you know to whom? Al Whittier. Who? Now, that's not a hard name. Al, A-L, Whittier, W-H-I-T. Al Whittier. Hey, what's the matter with you? Tell me about him. Oh, I I liked him. He believed in fellowship. Invited me over a couple of times for chatting. Well, I just want to get things straight, Mr. Uh... Kentner. Uh, Janet Benton lived here when, when she got married. Her husband's name was Al Whittier. What's your name? Clover. Danny Clover. Oh. Al Whittier moved in with her then. Oh, listen. They were married. Right in the living room. I was there. They were married, Mr. Clover. You've been exceptionally helpful, Mr. Kettner. I wonder whether I could prevail upon you to... Oh, name it. Name it. Mm, try to identify someone in the morgue for me. Love to. <laughs> That's Al, okay. <laughs> oh, Al, what do you... What do you know? Shot by a policeman. What do you know? Let's go outside in the corridor. Uh, for here. instance, uh, what happened to the person who's in oh, the... Oh, that next... one's empty. Huh? Let's go outside. Yeah. You can sit on that bench there, Mr. Kendra. How long has it been since you last saw Al Whittier? Oh, I couldn't say exactly, if that's what you want me to say. Uh Uh-uh, no, sir. I knew him, sure, but days and days. I could ask you some days and days, and I'll bet approximately. When he walked out on her? That night. He... Danny? Uh, Danny, this is Mr. Temple. Carl Temple, Lieutenant Clover. How you doing, Mr. Temple? I'm sorry for what's happened. Mr. Temple's had a terrible shock, Danny, but he says he'll take a look in here. Well, thanks for helping us out, Mr. Temple. Hmm. I like a fellow like that. A helper. Well, you're one. Yes. Well, the last time I saw Al Whittier, wasn't it? Mm-hmm, yes. Well, uh, after he had that argument, that terrible argument with his wife and went away, I never saw him again after that. Had they been married long when that happened? Six months. Uh... That's not fair to a marriage. What happened to Mrs. Whittier? Only as far as I know for sure. Of course. Well, she uh, she assumed her maiden name immediately. She stayed on for another few months, then goodbye to her. She vanished. Poof. You know, like they do. First you see it, and then you don't. Well, that's just like Janet. Mm. She was... Uh, Danny? Well? Uh, Mr. Temple couldn't identify the deceased, Danny. Never heard of the name Val Whittier, either. It's been a brutal day, hasn't it, Mr. Temple? Let's take Mr. Temple home. All of us. You haven't been home yet, have you, Mr. Temple? No. Uh, Look, uh, Mr. Clover... Just uh... one more minute, Mr. Kenner. I want to thank all of you for your courtesy. Mind if we come in? Why should you? Mind if Mr. Kentner takes one little peep inside? I don't see... Go ahead, Kentner, have a peep. Mm-hmm. What do you see? Well, well... Now, just play it straight, Mr. Kentner. What do you see? This is a good day for me. I've been very helpful. Come on, Kentner. You want me to say it's the furniture? Well, it's the furniture, all right. What's he talking about? What are you talking about, Kenner? It's the furniture, all right. I've seen it before, then, huh? I sat on it. Uh, you fellas want to see the reason that I was never asked back to the Whittiers? Well, you see the stain mark on the coffee table? I did it. Thanks a lot, Mr. Kenner. Hey, the, 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 the same bedroom furniture, too. Get him out of here, Margaret. All right, come on, Kenner, let's go. 
I get back to the office tomorrow, I'm going to dictate a letter to you. I'm regular stationary. Bye. Well, uh, goodbye. Goodbye, gentlemen. Now, what is this? You're a tired man, aren't you, Mr. Temple? Just answer my question. What is this? Did you push Janet Whittier out the window six years ago? Oh, that's it. Did you? She was drunk. She fell. You help her along? She was drunk. She fell. Were you close to her? She was drunk. She fell. Look, Mr. Temple... What do I want to be difficult for? Okay, what about her? What I said, she was drunk. You're she... being cute. No. Listen. I was nowhere near her. I, I brought her there, sure, but... I can get affidavits by the bushel. I was doing the baritone on Old Mill Stream when she jumped. I was three rooms down. Look. Yeah? I've been through enough. We just want to clear things up, that's all. What's happened, why it's happened. You figure Al Whittier killed your wife because he figured you killed his wife. All right, all right. Because you ran off with his wife and made a slob of her. One sloppy night, she fell out of a window and was killed. I don't feel anything for what happened to her. She knew what she was doing. Then Whittier answered an ad, size old furniture. Furniture he'd bought for Janet. Furniture he'd left her with. Furniture you came into when she died. So we figure your wife was murdered because... Just don't say it, huh? She was murdered because she was your wife. About the only reason we can figure. If she'd been married to somebody else, she'd be alive. Well, what do you want me to do? Just be sorry, that's all. He didn't have to take it out of my wife, did he? He did. That's why he ought to be sorry. Well. Well, what? It's been a lousy day. I, I'm tired. Tomorrow I gotta get rid of all this junk. You fellas know anybody who needs some furniture? It rolls over Broadway now, the shock of the night. And the sound of it, a thing of laughter and trumpet and a million-throated voice. And from a thousand streets they gather. To come here, to scream at the roar, let the wave of night roll over them, gather them up, spill them into the doorway of their choice. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's transcribed story, Frank Gerstel was heard as Mr. Temple and Junius Matthews as Mr. Kentner. Featured in the cast were Martha Wentworth, Eve McVeigh, Earl Ross, and Shepard Mencken. Bill Anders speaking. <laughs> There's fun afoot when you meet Millie and meet Mr. McNutley Thursday nights on CBS Radio. Elena Verdugo plays Millie Bronson in the wacky comic strip Come Alive that CBS Radio sends your way whenever you meet Millie. Ray Milland as Professor McNutley brings us more laughs when he buys a dress for a girl, a girl, not his wife, tomorrow night. Yes, meet Millie and meet Mr. McNutley for Thursday night laughs on most of these same stations. Here's the American Way, starring Horace Height, Thursday nights on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>